I grew up South of Atlanta, McDonough. I am a millennial. I was born in 1990, which I thought used to be so young. But now as I write it down, I was born in the 19th hundred century. I mean, it's just weird. When I tell my students um, I was born in 1990, you would think I was in World War II. They think that's very, very old. So I grew up south of Atlanta. I came up to True McConnell back in 2008. Uh, went through four years, graduated, and then I came back for my master's degree. Went to Thailand with Dr. Haynes, where we have made wonderful memories and quite... <laughs> Quite the many metaphors for psychology. We basically wrote a book. We'll tell you about that later. Great stories. Um, came back from a master's degree, graduated from Truett again. Then I went and worked at a church in Habersham. Then I am at a church uh, in Flowery Branch. It is known as Christ Place Church. Started there as a middle school pastor about four years ago. And then they transitioned me to a high school pastor. And now I kind of give leadership over everything from high school down to preschool. So you could call me the Gen Z pastor because everything that I do deals with Generation Z. And so tonight we're not going to be too, too long, but I am passionate about Generation Z. And this is kind of a first for me. Uh, lately there's been a few churches, uh, a couple from Texas and everywhere that have asked me to do these seminars. And then Dr. Haynes asked me to do one. Um, and I was excited and shocked, but... Uh, just to let you know, there's a lot of information when it comes to Gen Z. And the thing I don't want to do, I don't want to information dump on you because that's no fun. But you will hear a lot of statistics, and then I'm going to tell you some relevant stories in my life of how I'm seeing this play out. And then we're going to talk about some things that you can take and do with Generation Z to make progress with whatever you want to do. Um, so I'm excited about these seminars uh, I'm starting a social media account and a podcast about Generation Z. So afterwards, if you're like, hey, I want to follow this dorky dude on social media and learn more about Generation Z and see funny inter interviews or podcasts, then let me know. I'll give you that. If not, you're not going to hurt my feelings. It's quite okay. So my goal here is to do a few things. The first is I want to give you an idea of who Generation Z is. This will be my first time really lecturing about Generation Z with, gener with Generation Z in the room. Um, I tell my students, I work mainly with high school, uh, I preach every Wednesday, and I tell them things about themselves, and they just kind of blush and laugh like, yeah, it's true. So you might feel like that, or you might completely disagree with some things, and I would love to hear that. So we're going to talk about who Generation Z is, I'm going to talk, talk to you about their worldview, how it's formulated, and then we're going to do some Q&A. So that's going to be fun. I want to hear questions about Generation Z, what you know, what you have learned about them. But let's start with, what is the age range of Generation Z? So a lot of people debate this. The earliest, if you uh, look at some authors like James Henry White, they say, and research says, that Generation Z starts at 1995 or after. Was anyone born in 1995? Anybody in this room? 96? 97, 98, okay, we got three up there, 98, 99, oh, okay, 2000 and over, wow, <laughs> I was 10 years old in 2000, okay, so they argue back and forth, some say that Generation Z starts in 1995, others say it starts in 1999, but they've all kind of come to the conclusion it's between 97 and 99, 95 and 99, so I would consider all of you Generation Z from 97 and above, some would say 95. So that puts us that most of Generation Z, they are entering into college for the first time. They are graduating from college and they're starting to hit the market, okay? So they are projecting that Generation Z by the year of 2020 will own 40, will have $40 billion of buying power in the consumer market. So whether you know it or not, Companies have been talking about you for at least three years now, almost two, two to three years. Um, I remember after I first got this book, if you want to know more about your generation, this is a great book. It's Meet Generation Z by James Emery White. Um, if you work in a church or you work with students or if you want to see like development, spiritual development of students, this is a great resource because he talks a lot about that. But companies, about two years ago, I got an email and they talk about what you think about. They talk about what you talk about, and they have strategies to market things to you because you are going to be worth $40 billion to them. So you've got a lot of consumer buying power by the year 2020. And did you also know that you are the largest generation 
that is living on this planet currently. It's only by like 5%, but you're larger than any other generation. And I love telling this to my millennial friends because I'm a millennial. Millennials, they were very concerned with self-discovery. Like they want to know about themselves, emotions, feelings. I want to find out who I am. I'm going to venture off and climb into the mountains and sing songs, talk to squirrels. I don't know. Like they want to self-express and learn about themselves. And they still think the world is about them. But what they don't realize is companies, marketers, they are now forgetting about, about the millennials. And they're saying, we got to talk about Generation Z. So they're just coming through college. They're in college. You know you are Generation Z. So let's talk about their worldview. Let's talk about things that make Generation Z tick. And I, what I'm going to do is I've got several notes here. But I want to talk about six trends. But before I give you these six trends, I want to talk about forces that are, are forming this generation. The first force is technology. We are very tech savvy. I grew up with dial-up internet. Do you even know what dial-up internet is? Okay. How many of you have known a life without Wi-Fi? <laughs> okay, okay. When I first got to Truett McConnell, they, during check-in process, when you came, they would hand you an ethernet cable to plug into your room, to plug up to your laptop. That's how old I am. And I remember like in a, within the first year when, I forget when, who got here, but they said, we're going to get Wi-Fi in all the dorms. You would have thought that we won the lottery because we were thinking, how can we have Wi-Fi? Just to put it in perspective, when I got to college, the iPhone had not came out fully and hit the market with everyone yet. I still had flip phones. Everyone had flip phones. And so what is a force that's forming your generation is technology. It's just rapidly booming. And the more ch technology changes, you're going to change. And we're going to see this in a second, but they have labeled you as iGen and the digital native generation. We have never seen a generation so connected to technology, and uh, Dr. Haynes probably knows this, but a lot of psychology and psychological discussions and articles are coming out of what this technology is doing to our brains. Um, and the research is quite fascinating. A lot of you, a lot of us, we are like toddlers. We are addicted, and it's the same thing, like if you let a toddler play with something or have candy and you take it away, oh my goodness, the, the mini Hulk comes out. Well, we're going to talk about some of that stuff that's already happening with your generation. So technology is one thing that, that's forming you. The next thing is worldview, identity, security, diversity, and parents. So that's what we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about all these things. We're going to summarize it. I'm going to watch the clock, and I'm not going to bore you to death. And about midway through, I'll give you a bathroom break so you can get up, stretch your legs, and high-five me, maybe. I don't know. So let's talk about six trends that are shaping your worldview, generation's worldview. The first is screenagers. This is a nickname that you have been given whether you know it or not, and it has a lot of people paying attention. We call you sc screenagers, and there's a lot of reasons for this. The first is you're the first generation to be connected from birth, and also you're the first generation that... If you have any question about anything in life, what do you do? You Google it. You say, hey, Siri, what's the weather outside? And it tells you. Okay. Here's the weather for today. Man, it's 51 degrees. Or you can say, hey, Siri, what's my purpose in life? This is the first generation where we're seeing that you're not going to traditional forms of information like maybe a mentor, maybe a parent, maybe a teacher. Any question, any life intersect that you have, the first thing you do is you Google it. And you're going to notice this, like when you get married, when you have relationships, whenever you're going through weird things, the first thing you're going to do is look for articles. What are people saying? Forums are massive right now. And so you're the first generation to be connected from birth, but also you like to learn everything you can and try to figure it out on your own. You want to know all the answers and you try to get the answers by yourself. So you're connected from birth. Uh, you get any answer that you want almost instantaneously. Then you have nomophobia. Can anyone take a guess of what nomophobia means? It's the fear of being separated from your phone. So they have actually done studies, and I know some of you are like, what? Your anxiety level actually goes up if someone takes your phone from you. I don't know if you've noticed it. When you, what do you call it, the calf now? Is that where y'all eat the calf, the cafeteria, cafe? What is it called, calf, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. That's what we always call it. When I got here, everyone talked face to face because you were on flip phones, you had to text. Now, if you notice, everyone eats like this. 
and you're multitasking because how many of you stay on your phone during meals? How many of you sit at a table and Snapchat each other or text other people in the room while you're sitting in the room eating with them? You might not do it as much, but I promise you those in your generation that are just a few years younger than you, that's how they communicate when they are face to face. They are like this. They're taking Snapchats of people, drawing funny things, making fun of each other, you know, sliding in those DMs, you know what I'm talking about, instead of asking people out on a date, the first thing they're going to do is message, maybe find you on Tinder, Bumble, whatever else there is. We're going to talk about some of those apps later for some older people in the room because you're like, what is any of that? But you're so connected and you use this all the time and it, and it changes how you communicate with people. So when people take this away, your anxiety actually goes up. There's been tests to actually prove this, nomophobia. But this is where I think it gets, it gets really, really interesting. 57% of Gen Z, 57% use a screen or a smartphone or some type of media device four plus hours a day, in addition to what all you already have going on. So 57% of you use it four plus hours, but then 30% uses eight plus hours of media and screen time a day. Now let me tell you how this is affecting you. You don't realize it, but you've been given unlimited access to the internet. The number one response I get from students, and I guarantee you if I, if I asked you, if I asked people on this campus, hey, how are you doing? I've already asked four people while I was staying up at the CAF because it was overnight, whatever that is, the, where they come spend the night, it's kind of weird. But they're doing that tonight. And so they're hanging out, they're bringing their sleeping bags, mom and dad are walking with them, it's really a great time. Um, I just kind of would feel weird about it because I was a different generation, but whatever. And so I was asking them, like, hey, how are you doing? Because I've seen some of my students here. Here's, here's the famous response I get. I'm tired. How many times do you say, I'm tired, when someone says, hey, how are you doing? Was your name Rachel or were you Rachel? Rachel, how are you doing? I'm tired. Well, on average, your generation gets six to seven hours of sleep per night. Six to seven hours of sleep per night, which is not good. It's not healthy. And that's on average. Some of my students, they stay up till three, four, five o'clock in the morning playing on these things, searching the web, looking at Instagram, being on their Finsta, their Insta, anything that they can get on, you know, Fortnite, um, all the other weird games. Like there's so many games now and they stay on it constantly and it's affecting your mood. Like some of you, when I meet you, you're grumpy. You're grumpy right now, and it's okay. I've got M&Ms. I'll throw it to you. But it, it affects your mood because you're staying so connected. It, it really does a lot to your sleep pattern. So that's just another thing. But, but here is where it gets really, really interesting and kind of kind of scary. It's something that we like to look at, especially me as a youth pastor. This is what I would tell parents to look at, uh, teachers. Um, on average... You know, Gen Z gets less than seven hours of sleep. But here's the thing that's about you being screenagers. You are psychologically more vulnerable than any other generation. Did you know that? That you are psychologically more vulnerable than any other generation. And your peers who have been tested, studied, uh, interviewed, questioned, they have attested to this. And let me tell you some of the reasons why that you feel like you're more vulnerable and actually you're physically safer than any other generation. Um, and let me tell you why this is. A lot of other generations, like for my generation, even though I'm not far behind you, it's a world of difference. Um, when I wanted to hang out with people, when I wanted to see people, when I wanted to meet new people, like, man, me and my girlfriend just broke up, how am I going to meet more people? I had to go to places to meet people. Like I would go to the movie theater, the bowling alley. We would go play pool or whatever because smartphones hadn't been invented yet. Apps had not been invented yet. We had MySpace. That was it. Do any of you have a MySpace? Yeah, exactly. It's old. I had a MySpace where you could put music on your wall. You could put a backdrop, wallpaper. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And so you had to meet people in person and talk and, and all this stuff. And when you were bored, teenagers would get together and hang out. And when teenagers got together and hung out, bad things would kind of happen. That's how you had a lot of DUIs, a lot of teen pregnancies. A lot of these things skyrocketed. Well, this past generation, your generation, they've actually begun to lower. So you're not as physically in danger as previous generations, but you're mentally more in danger. And let me tell you why that is. You stay on the line on you know, apps and everything longer than anyone else, and you're connecting with people. But here's some statistics for you. Your anxiety and depression for teens 
or for you guys, skyrocketed when you get on social media. And this is why. You feel like your social media is your resume. You feel like it's got to be picture perfect. And I wrote some uh, statistics down. 31% feel bad about how they look when they see other people's social media. So this is what happens, and I deal with this all the time, and it deals with the psychological development of your image and your identity. And it goes straight to the heart. So if you're a parent or a teacher listening to this, identity crisis is something you're going to see as a big problem and issue with Generation Z. But I didn't know this, and some of you people in the room, ladies and gentlemen, maybe you can attest to this, but when they, 31%, when they go on uh, Instagram, social media, whatever you use, and they see how good someone looks, it makes them feel bad about themselves. One thing I didn't know, you have apps to make yourself look better. Did y'all know that? Some of you, you don't want to admit it. I see you're grinning. There are apps to make your face look a certain color. There are apps to erase some of, you know, your double chin. You're like, "Uh uh-oh. Okay, I got like Play-Doh underneath there. I need to erase some of that. There's apps to make your eyes look brighter and to do all this Photoshopping and image editing. Oh, my hips are too big. Make them look smaller. I had no idea that this existed. People in my youth group do this because they are trying to keep up with this image of if my life is for everyone to see, I have got to look the best that I can look. So when people get on social media, They want to portray that they're healthy and happy. But the reality is it creates the opposite effect. See, Gen Z is uh, really focused about one thing. Their main goal in life is happiness and success. And they want to do anything to reach happiness and to reach success. You're more career and goal-oriented and educationally oriented and task-focused than the millennial generation. You want to reach happiness. And we're going to talk about what that looks like to you guys. Uh, So when you get on social media, even though you're not actually happy, you make yourself seem to be happy. And there's 37% of you, you feel more depressed when you see how exciting someone's life is compared to yours. I don't know if this has happened to you, but have you ever been scrolling through, you're in your room, you're locked alone, and that's another reason for depression and anxiety is you're locked alone, you go into your room, you seclude yourself, and you scroll. And this happens when you lose friendships or lose a relationship You scroll and you see that person or you see your friends hanging out with other people and you are keenly aware that you're not invited and you feel like no one cares about you. See, this is the most dangerous thing, I think, because when I was growing up, you know, like I told you, I had my space. But when you broke up with someone, you just broke up with them. You didn't have to see it everywhere. If you lost a friend, let's say Jake. Jake was a turd. Can I say turd? I'm sorry. Jake was a... You know, he was just a mean person. Let's say Jake and I had a fight and we just got, we were done. I didn't have to see Jake ever again. But the problem with you guys, let's say Sally is dating Sammy. And Sammy breaks Sally's heart. And Sally's friends sided with Sammy. That's a lot of S's. And they all are hanging out. And now Sally's at home watching Sammy hang out with everyone. Who this affects more so, and, and I hate to say it, but the statistics don't lie, ladies. Whenever your friends don't invite you to go and hang out places, you are more aware than ever and you feel like a loser because they're out hanging out, eating at the mall, or whenever they interact, you're sitting there going, why didn't I get invited? I bet you some of you have had that thought like, well, why didn't I get invited? Why are they hanging out? Why, why am I not included? And it's that phrase FOMO, fear of missing out. So you know when you are left out. So going back to social media, you feel like it's your resume. You feel like you got to keep up with everyone else and look perfect. And you feel like you got to portray happiness. Um, But then this is an interesting, you feel like you can't really be you on social media. Because you've been told and you've seen from other people that what is said on social media and put on social media can be used against you. I've said this. I tell my students, I'm like, don't be dumb. Don't be dumb on social media because they will take it and they will use it against you. And I've actually dealt with certain hiring situations where we went through social media accounts and we said, you know what, it's probably not a good fit for us. Sorry. So do you know what the backlash of this is for you guys? And this is great for parents to know. You create fake profiles to actually give the presence of realness and you know, the perfectness. And then you have a hidden account. For you and your close friends. Now, I don't know if some of you do this, but I know at least for 16 and younger, this is a big, big thing. They're called Rinstas. They're called Finstas. And basically, it's where you and your close friends get together 
and you get to really show who you are. Um, this is a great way to lie to parents, and I've had several parents in my office telling them, hey, um, who you think little Sally is is not who Sally actually is. Here's the fake Instagram. And a lot of times what's happening is Generation Z, they're very smart. They know what they're doing. On all, they're very techno, technologically savvy when it comes to their parents. Their parents are like, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what that app is. I mean, my mom calls me all the time. Hey, how do I, how do I take a picture? I'm like, oh, my goodness. But you're, you're way more advanced than anyone else because you've been so connected. But you've also learned how to lie, how to get around things, how to give the presence of something real how to give the presence of something that's actually happy, but deep inside you're dying. And you don't want to talk about it because you feel like in order to portray who you really are, you're skeptical of everyone. And we're just jumping through a lot of things because I don't got a lot of time to give you everything that I have. But let me tell you why you do that. How old were you in 2008? Eight years old. Okay, so a lot of psychologists would say you're becoming aware of the environment and social cues and social culture around you, around seven, eight. Your worldview's already been kind of established and you're starting to learn and you're very aware of what's going on. Can anyone tell me what happened in 2008? Boom, market crash. It was awful. You saw your parents lose jobs. You had to start saving money, skimping on money. You've only known a world and culture of war, the war on terror. You've only known a world of uh, economic collapse, market collapse, of shootings all the time, of online stuff. That's all you've known, and you don't think the world is a safe place. And this is somewhere in my presentation, but I'm just going to give you the nuggets that I really get passionate about, and then we can talk in the Q&A. But you don't think the world is a safe place. It makes you very skeptical. You're skeptical of teachers, of institutions of church leaders as a whole, I'm not saying you probably individually, but you're very skeptical. And so this even comes to back to the social media thing. The reason you feel depressed is because you have to hide who you are because it takes a lot for you to trust someone with who you are. Because what are you afraid of? They're going to stab you in the back. You're afraid, man, they're going to, this is what they're going to do to me. So you, you keep everything closed. And so you make these profiles and stuff. Um, and what I tell parents, and we're going to get into this, um, your parents are double-minded. If I could say that. They are very cautious and overbearing in some ways. They're helicopters, but on the other, they're too detached. And one area of life that they are so detached in is social media and the monster of the World Wide Web. They have no idea what you're introduced to. Because also in social media, one big thing that's a problem with your generation is pornography. A massive amount of Generation Z is introduced to pornography before the age of 16. A massive amount, like over 60% is introduced to it. Because of social media, it's everywhere. If you want to find it, you can find it. And if you want to hide it, you can hide it from your parents. You can find anything you want to find and communicate with anyone who you want to communicate to. I had a student that had their own Netflix account and everything because their mom gave them an iPod, iPad. And they understand that with an iPad, with Wi-Fi connection and other emails, this like 13 or 14 year old set up their own Netflix account, set up their own, all this other stuff because they got an allowance. They used it. And so they had this whole digital footprint, this whole digital archive of who they were, the fences, the rinsers, and their parents didn't even think they were on social media. <laughs> Y'all are a smart bunch. It kind of scares me for my kids, but it's like, whoo. Man, like, you know how to do what you're going to do, and you, get, and you have money to do the stuff that you want to do. So parents give you uh, allowances, and I thought this was interesting. Um, a lot of Gen Z, don't ha don't, they don't have this. This is a wallet. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a wallet. I keep my cards in it. Sometimes I keep cash in it. But um, help me out here with the app that you can pay stuff. There's Apple Pay, and then it's Venmo. Venmo, right? So a lot of people use social media to get paid and their parents never even know it. So I've got a lot of students that are on TikTok. Do you know what TikTok is? Okay, TikTok is you do these dumb videos, these short things, and if people like it, anyone can watch it. And if they like it, they pay you for it. Like I got on there just because I was interested. I'm like, okay. Some people don't even think I'm cool and hip. I can get on there, I'm gonna find out. And I went and followed some of my students. <laughs> oh man, you should have seen their faces when I said, oh, so you did this video on TikTok. Um, 
But people will pay people for becoming famous on Instagram and on, on not Twitter as much. You don't use that as much, but YouTube. YouTube is a big deal. You know, you become your own YouTube star. Um, who's the guy that uh, got shunned for walking in the Japanese forest? Um, what's his name? Blonde dude. Logan. Yeah, you know who it is. Y'all can say, I ain't going to judge you in here. Logan Paul. Prime example. He became an entrepreneur, did great on YouTube, raked in all this money, and became a millionaire without even hitting the age of 19, 20. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so you're using social media to your advantage, and parents and teachers and preachers, everyone has no idea the access that you have. But I want to talk to you one thing about, um, that I think about social media that I've seen, um, just, just to talk, and we've got some more time. Um, one thing I've seen is, is a phrase that's been coined by a psychologist, and I'll, I'll look up their name and give them credit later, uh, coding. Now, you probably haven't heard of this phrase, coding. Um, maybe you have, maybe you're just a lot smarter than me, which you probably are. But coding is because you're digital natives, you can adapt and fit into any situation that you want to. Um, and you can become like almost chameleon-like. Like if you're around this group of people, you can shift into fitting in because you've done it so much on social media. You know how to fit in and tell people what they want to hear. So a prime example of this is, um, let's say you're around country friends. All of a sudden, you're going to turn country. You're going to salt life, baby. Yeah, woo! And you'll start talking more with the slang. You're going to be talking, you start to pick up on the social cues, and you're like, okay, everybody accepts this. Everybody's like this. So I know how to code myself and form to fit into this group of people. If you're with like ghetto friends, you're going to start talking more ghetto. If you're with more educational friends, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm very smart. I like this. You're, you're very aware of trends and who you're with, and you want to speak to, a plea, to appease these friends. Um, I've seen this. Do you know where I've seen it? I am a youth pastor, and I get students who lie to me 24-7 all the time, and they're sitting there like, I love Jesus. I want to do things right. I'm like, no, you don't. You're just telling me what I want to know. And that's a part of coding. Like, you can tell your parents what they want to know. You can even go to church and make them think, man, my baby is the most greatest thing ever. In all reality, they don't know the other side of the coin that you're just fitting in wherever you go. And the reason there's been more data that's been put out to support this, one is, uh, and we're going to talk about morals here in a second, uh, but morally, you... Um, you believe in moral relativism. Like you're, everything's relative. Truth is relative. That means it's whatever culture and individuals say. So morally, there's no like hierarchy really. It's kind of just go with the flow, whatever you decide. Um, do you know the number or the percent of people that think lying is a sin in your generation? Only around 30% believe that lying is a sin. Yeah, it, it's crazy, but only 30% say, okay, well, lying's bad. Lion's not good. 30%. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. Oh, oh my goodness. I have had so many students, and I want to say it by name, but it's on videotape, so I can't. Um, they will lie to me. And even when I catch them in the lies and say, hey, actually, here's the proof, they believe that they can get out of it and lie because they don't see anything wrong with lying. In fact, uh, when, once the survey was done, I think it was over like 2,500 participants, um, when it comes to morals, they, Generation Z believes, that recycling is more important than lying or watching pornography. What I mean by that is they believe that if you don't recycle, that is more morally wrong than watching porn or lying. So if you don't pick up a bottle and put it in a trash can, you've actually done something wrong. But if you lie or watch pornography, ah, it's relative. It's all up to you. That's kind of the stuff that we're dealing with, but we're going to get back to the screenagers. So coding is a big deal. That's where I'm going to stop it with social media. I could honestly talk another hour about social media because it's the biggest beast for your generation because you're constantly connected. You can make your own money. You can have your own accounts, your own emails, everything without your parents even knowing. And this has led to, oh, i got to say this. This has led to childhood disappearing. So by and large, Childhood has disappeared. Used to, there was this innocence of childhood. Like, oh, you know. But now we've got the Momo challenge. Have you even heard about that? 
Okay, some say it's a hoax. Some say there are actual some things that have been attributed to it. So some of the fabrication is a hoax, but there are actually some real parts of it. Do you know one story that I was watching looking up? A seven-year-old, seven years old, has his own iPad and iPod or iPhone and gets full access in his room at night. Gets to watch YouTube, does whatever at seven years old. So childhood and the, you know, just the innocence of childhood is out the door. We're having people, you had to grow up real quick. And I feel sorry about the alpha generation. This is a generation after you. Um, they're going to be even more ferocious, I think, than you guys. But we can talk about them another time. So I'm going to take a pause right now. We've been in it for about 40 minutes. Any questions about social media? I want to kind of open up the floor before we go on to the next. I know I said we're going to talk about six trends. We only might get to three. But what is any questions about social media, about anything I mentioned? Or even if you just want to say, hey, Ben. I like your vest. And I'll be like, cool, that's great. Um, I just feel like it's a good time to take a break. So any questions? You can think on it. I'm going to look at my notes, and if you've got a question, just say, yo. Rachel, you look like you got a question. Does anyone, like, agree with some of these stats? Like, do you feel like sometimes you get anxious on social media, or you kind of feel left out, um, depressed? Uh, another thing that comes alongside of that, the anxiety and depression, uh, test and the worrying of doing well with your career. We're going to talk about that, but um, a lot of you, how many of you are stressed out about school and tests and doing well? Yeah, okay. You know what? Let's just go ahead and talk about this before I move on to the next one. I, I say we're going to take a break, but I get too excited. I can't help it. Um, so your generation, the, they have one goal in life. If your goal in life is to be successful and happy, and do you know how a majority of your generation defines success and happy? Money, 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 money. You don't even know that song, but money. You love money, um, and you want to pursue money, and there's a reason you want to pursue money. The reason you like money and you're going after it is because you grew up in the economic collapse. You saw your parents lose jobs. If your dad was a contractor and mom was a contractor or worked in construction, you lost everything. Stock markets crashed. I mean, it was bad. And so a lot of you, you want happiness, and you've defined that as earning money and doing things with money. And so right after that with happiness is uh, schooling and a career and education. Uh, more so than other generations, you know what you kind of want to do, and you want to go after it. Um, you're more entrepreneur. You want to say, hey, I'm, I'm going after it, whereas uh, the generation Y, the millennials, we were more about self-discovery, as I talked about walking through the mountains, figuring out who we are, figuring out the deeper purpose of life. Um, I can even think of people right now, Dr. Haynes, that we could talk about that just wants deeper meaning of life. You, on the other hand, you want a career, and you want to make a difference, and you want to make a big difference in the world. Um, and the career is something that drives you to the nth degree, and it's one of the biggest causes of stress, anxiety, and depression in your life. Because when you feel like you fail a test, your world is crumbling. Do you know how I felt when I failed a test? I'm going to go get something to eat. Make me feel better. And I forgot about it. I didn't really care about failing tests. I was like, ah, I'll study, Meh, whatever. You know, I still did good, but <laughs> that didn't stress me out. But this generation, man, like, like if there's a big exam or a project coming, you will miss four days of any social activity to study and prepare for these tests. And I'm like... Just fail it. I mean, don't actually do that, but that's my mind frame. It's like, forget that. Go have fun. Like, that makes no sense. But see, whereas my generation was more about experience, they wanted to experience things. Your generation is about, you know, getting happiness, getting an educational goal, career-minded, and you want to do trendy things. Like, you want to do stuff with your life. And so that creates a lot of anxiety and stress because you feel like you have to be perfect and you've got to pass because if you don't pass, get a career, you'll never get money. If you don't get money, you'll be a loser. And if you're a loser, your life's over. So there's that. Now I'll take a break. Any questions before we move on to the second trend, which is you are post-Christian? We're going to fly through that one. Any questions, thoughts? No? I thought I saw a hand. I see that hand. Going once. What about you in the very back? I feel like you almost, yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not a parent. Uh, I'm a student pastor. 
Okay. So that's a fun conversation starter because when we look at divided, how divided your parents are, um, it continues in the sense of when I was talking about some things are hands off on, some things are very helicopter parent about. Uh, when it comes to social media, they are torn in half. When it comes to smartphones, they're torn in half. And let me tell you why. On the one side of the coin, they're like, we know this is probably really bad for our students. We know that you know, this is probably not good. It's probably causing things. But on the other hand, they don't want you to fall behind. Um, they are deathly afraid that you're going to fall behind in the generation because all these other kids are so heavily engrossed in technology, and they believe that technology is going to be the forefront of wherever we go, and it's the future of our society. So they don't know how to approach that conversation because half of them says, no, no social media. And the other half of them says, but I don't want you to fail behind. And so even though they're split, um, I think it was like, like a well above 50% of parents said, I, I wish my, my you know, kids didn't have smartphones or social media accounts, but then like 96% of them allowed them to have smartphones and social media. So how I would approach the conversation with a parent and have many times before, um, there are many ways to monitor social media, um, but the worst thing you wanna do, you don't wanna be a dictator and say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Um, as one of the articles called it, um, we don't need a, a, a gospel of sin management, which is a lot of times what we err on, and we don't talk and have open discussions about the dangers of things. Um, so a big thing with this generation, especially the male side of it from studies that have come out, um, they want to know why. And I'm, I'm probably like this, a lot of you are probably like that, why do we need to do these things? Don't just tell me no, tell me why. I'm very capable, I'm very independent. I can book me a flight to Japan right now, hop on it and go without even needing you because um, they're very independent. But I would say you've got to start um, doing some research yourself as parents. Um, ignorance is not allowed. And that's a, a metaphor that I'm taking in my household with raising my son is, I've told my wife, ignorance is not allowed. It's not okay that, well, we just didn't know. Well, no, that's on me. Um, be informed. Learn what's good and what's bad. Um, there are many you know, sources of information. I would tell them, <laughs> selfishly, subscribe to my podcast and to the Instagram page that I have to learn more about, hey, what's out there? What apps are out there? Um, I don't know if any of you have this. You probably don't. But there are apps out there to hide apps. I don't know if you've ever known about this, but there are apps to hide apps. So that way your parents can't find anything about what you're doing. Um, one famous one that I've had some problems in my youth group with is a calculator app. And it looks just like the calculator. You pull it up and it looks like a calculator, but you put in certain numbers, which is actually a code, and it unlocks a hidden screen where it has all the apps that you want to hide from people. Um, kind of nifty, kind of cool. Um, I would have loved that when I was younger if I had apps. Um, but a lot of people have these apps and, and some dangerous apps. I would tell them about dangerous apps. We already know that social media causes more anxiety and depression. Um, some very, very dumb apps that I hate They've, some have phased out, like Yik Yak. That was an old one. It's phased out. You probably don't even know what it is now. Um, but this ask me this, ask me that, or you rate people, or you tell how you actually feel about people. There are so many, like After School or Sarah Says. I forget. I've got a whole list um, of apps that are dangerous. Uh, just be informed and have open discussions because a lot of times those apps are very dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> what I would always suggest, and I tell uh, parents, I'm like, y'all don't need your phone all night. Like, you don't. I mean, I know I, I hate it uh, for you guys, but studies show when people remove the phone from you, yes, you act like a drug dealer at first, and you literally have the same reaction that a drug user has. No, give me my phone! But you're happier the more distance we can give you with it. And so I would say, man, have a, have a cutoff time. Now, I'm not some 
you know, end all be all, that's up to each and every you know, individual person, but I would suggest having a cutoff time, and especially at a young age. There's a reason um, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates uh, did not allow their children to have access to screens and they went to you know schools with no screens and all that kind of stuff and they didn't allow them to have certain social medias till a certain age is because the studies are coming out that this is having a major impact on your cognitive thinking and one thing I didn't even talk about is your creativity you are less creative did you know that because of social media and all that stuff you're being told how to think you're not problem solving for yourself uh, you're told how to view things, to look up things, so you're less creative, you don't problem solve, and you're not, especially with the millennials, millennials are not mentally as tough. You know, Generation X and you know, the boomers, the, the silent generation, you can tell them, hey, I hate you, you're fat and you're ugly, and they're like, cool, where's my chicken biscuit? Like, they don't care. Like, that doesn't affect them because they've, you know, been through the stuff, but the younger you get, the more it's like, ee. So I would say I would regulate how much screen time you get. And that's why you're seeing the pushback on iPhones. They now tell you how much time in the latest update, they tell you how much time you spend on social media. Um, and if you watch some of the interviews of people who've worked with Facebook and, and um, uh, the Tesla guy talking about what social media was designed to do, um, I don't think it's going to be long before the dark closet is opened up and I think, I like to make bold predictions, I think in a few years you're going to see a revolt around social media and stuff um, because you're going to see it's run its course and I think there's going to be a generation that says, I want real and authentic relationships instead of, or it could just keep going down the dark abyss and, oh well, Terminator, here we are. <laughs> uh, so that was a good question. I like that question. I would say regulate. That's why I encourage parents to do. Don't just say, hey, here's free access because a lot of parents don't even know the own dangers and you're handing your kid an open forum to strangers, to people, because there are people, especially with sex trafficking and um, uh, child pornography, that know all the apps to hit people up on. Um, I've had young students approached on Fortnite, um, you know, different gaming platforms. I've had uh, students approached on House Party. I don't know if y'all use that anymore. House Party, Marco Polo, it's a lot of these forming apps where you can get online with a bunch of people and talk and hang out and anyone can jump in, jump off if it's not private. So that's what I always tell parents, like you don't know the dangers. You think it's just YouTube kids, woo. No, there's a lot of dangerous things out there. Um, and so you, there's a dark hole, but that was a good question. Any other questions before we move on? No. Does anyone need a bathroom break? No, we're trucking. Man, y'all are bought in, kind of. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next thing that's uh, shaping your worldview. And by and large, um, Generation Z is a post-Christian generation. Now, I don't know what your personal beliefs are in this room. You might be Christian. You might not be. You might be atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, you know, Islamic. I don't know. But by and large, American culture, Western culture, especially for the last, I don't know, 80 to 100 years, heavily Christian culture where if you didn't go to church, I mean, I don't know if this is how, you probably didn't grow up this way, but this is how I grew up. If you didn't wear the right things to church, if you didn't go to church, um, you were a terrible, terrible person. If you believed in certain social norms or you were, you were terrible, things were like frowned upon because you grew up, everybody knew who Moses was. Everybody, even if you didn't go to church, you kind of knew what the Bible was about, David and Goliath. You know, it was just a cultural thing that everybody kind of went to church. You hung out like a country club and you go home. Well, now this is the first generation where you are a post-Christian generation. Um, you don't know a lot about the Bible. Um, and this is more for youth pastors or, you know, parents who want to raise them to, to know, you know, Christianity and God. Um, this is interesting that they don't know exactly or anything really about the Bible like previous generations. So uh, a prime example of this, and this was a slap in my face, um, if you talk about God or Jesus, they kind of have an idea about it. But when you say the Gospel of John, they're like, what does that even mean? When you say the Old Testament, it's like, okay, I think I've heard of that. When you talk about David, you're like, you mean the dude in my Spanish class? I know David, he sits right next to me. They have no idea of, we talk a lot like this generation has a mindset and understanding of all this Bible knowledge. 
But see, I came from a generation in previous generations in America, they grew up in Sunday school, Sunday school generation, where you knew it, you went to church, you learned about the Ten Commandments, you learned about the Bible. But I'm going to use this, and I'm actually going to use the whiteboard. I don't know where that marker went. Um, used to, let's, let's imagine this, let's draw a scale, okay? So let's, let's a scale, and let's say over here, I'm not a really good drawer, but that's okay. So let's say if you're a youth pastor in the room or you're a believer, let's say over here is a 10, okay? And 10 equals knowing Jesus. And what I mean by knowing is a relationship with Jesus. So that means you are saved, okay? That means biblically we know what that means. You're saved, you know Jesus, you're going to heaven, you know God, you live your life in accordance to, you surrender to him. That's a 10. So used to in America... The generations used to be an eight. That means they had previous knowledge of everything in the Bible. They knew that there was a God. They knew that there was this dude named Jesus. They knew about the Ten Commandments and people. And so what would happen is we would have these big events. I don't know if you've ever seen like the Billy Graham Crusades or D-Now or camps. And, and what used to happen is hundreds of students would make the jump from here to here. Because all they needed was a push. They just need that, the dots to be connected. Oh, there's someone who created someone, what? And all they need to know is, hey, God loved you. He loved you so much that he sent someone to take your place. And if you believe in him, you'll be saved if you believe in Jesus. So they would make that jump. It was very easy. That's why you would see so many people get saved. But now this generation, and this comes from James Emery White. He, he has a great explanation. They're around a zero to a two. That is where they're at of unchurched Generation Z. They don't know hardly anything. And actually, they've, they've called them a spiritual blank slate. Um, I'm just going to write that down because it makes me feel better. I like to write things. They are a spiritual blank slate. Um, I've got some of the statistics here that I, I think will, will shock you. Um, let's see, post-Christian. Oh, where is it? Okay. Well, I don't want to say that yet because that's going to be a good one. Um, no, I don't want to say that either. Okay, whatever. Uh, a majority of them define, I think it's like 43%, I will give you the statistic afterwards, 43% um, of Generation Z, unchurched completely, they um, define themselves as either agnostic, atheist, none, or other. So about 42 to 43% of Generation Z say they're either agnostic, atheist, other religion, or nothing. And the largest one that has grown in the past couple of years are the nuns. There's a book out called Rise of the Nuns, and it talks about generations are now saying, yeah, I'm nothing. I, I don't, not like none, like, ha, 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 no. Like, I don't equate to any of this junk. I agree with none of this. I'm good. I'm a spiritual blank slate. And so there is a zero and a two. And so you, we have to change our mindset of how we communicate. And James Henry White does a great job of this. Um, in Acts, he gives two examples. If you know the book of Acts, it is a book in the New Testament written about the journey of the new church. You see how I just explained that to you? It's because I can't say the book of Acts and everybody, I can't assume that everyone knows what that means. When I say the gospel of John, I can't assume people know what that means. So literally, when I get up to speak on Wednesday nights, this is what I have to do. Hey guys, I'm so excited to be with you. We're going to learn about this dude named Jesus. Jesus made some pretty big claims. He claimed to be the Son of God. We historically know that there was a guy named Jesus. The, the thing that everybody fights about is who does Jesus say he is and is it true? So we're going to look, about, look at a story written about him. It's found in a book that was written by a guy named John. And this is an account of Jesus. So there's this guy named John. He wrote about the life of Jesus. So turn with me to the book of John. I have to say all of that for everybody to be on the same playing field. Because if I get up there and say, hey, turn to the Gospel of John, no one really knows what that means anymore, especially in this generation. So you have to change completely how you communicate. And you got to change how you think. Um, I've noticed this in the ministries that I've been in. The church loves to think in, man, I want numbers. I want big baptisms. I want big salvations. And so these big denials, we used to think, if I didn't get a lot of saved people, I have failed. Well, what we learned is a lot, fewer and fewer people were doing this. 
lots and lots of people were not jumping from this. Um, to give you an example, we did a D now, and we pushed. It was you know gospel focused. It was like, come on, let's do it, let's do it. And I think like three people made decisions out of like 300 plus people being there. Three. So then we asked ourselves, okay, does D now not work anymore? What do we need to do? So then we took the whole next year. And instead of assuming everybody's at an eight, what we started doing is we strategically started moving people down the line. So we strategically started talking about things to get this generation to move to a better understanding of who Jesus is, of who God is. And then once we got them here to an eight or whatever, then we leveraged our big events for the big push. So we did this, and last year at our camp, we saw 50 decisions, and we baptized like 33 people in lake water because, I mean, it was incredible. God moved, God worked, but the focus of our ministry was to move them down the line and then make a push at the end. And so you have to get them. So it takes a lot more work. And two examples that he gives in the book of Acts, um, Acts chapter 2, Peter is talking to a bunch of Jewish people. Jewish people know the traditions and stuff. And this is what basically Peter does. He gives up and says, hey, you know that dude that all the prophets talked about in the Old Testament? You know the Messiah that they said was coming from the line of David? Yeah, okay, well, he was here, and you killed him. His name was Jesus. Go look in the tomb. He's rose from the grave. Repent. And what, like 3,000 people repented and like got saved? Because they already had the pre-knowledge. It didn't take a lot of explaining. Peter just said, hey, remember all those dots? Boom, boom, boom. Believe. Now fast forward to Acts chapter 17, verse 16 through 34. You have Paul, who's talking to this group in, in Athens, and they know nothing about God. And he has to start, he goes... Listen, I see that there's an idol here that you say to, to the unknown God. Let's talk about this. What if I told you I knew who the unknown God is and that he's the only God? What if I told you I knew that God? See, in the beginning, and he goes all the way back to creation, and he walks them through. And what ends up happening? Like four or five people make a decision, but other people just laugh and mock him. But that's where we're at. We're at an Acts 17 moment in our culture, not an Acts 2 moment. So um, that's just a little side note, how we talk to Generation Z. Um, I didn't know how many of you would actually be in here. So when you talk to your own generation, ah, remember, they're not right here. They're back here. So um, any questions about uh, the post-Christian uh, worldview that they have? You want to hear some moral things that y'all think about? Um, I'll just talk about it really, really quickly. I'm going to turn to page 55 because it's really great. Um, I've got some, just to show you how post-Christian we kind of are. I'm going to hurry with this. Um, i got some great, so 34% of all Gen Z think it is morally wrong to lie. Only 34% of you. Now, they kind of broke it down, and, it, and it's interesting. We're about to see over here engaged Christians, church Christians, and Gen Z. So, um, let me kind of break this down. This is a lot of information to take in. But with this study, one thing that they did that I thought was very cool, there's a difference in your generation between engaged Christians and just churched Christians. Okay? Engaged Christians, they did a, a nine points of theology that they asked them, like, do you go to church? Do you read your Bible? Do you believe Jesus is this? And so that's how they vetted out churched Christians to engaged Christians. Um, and the studies are just crazy. So when you look at engaged Christians, 77% of them say that lying is wrong. Now that sounds more like it. Like 77% of engaged Christians who have parents that are involved, who, who have been discipled, they believe lying is wrong. Do you know how many of church Christians believe lying is wrong? Only 38%. See how that drastically drops? Now, church Christians, that's just people that show up. That is people that are in our church buildings. No wonder we have a lot of people that think we're hypocritical because we got a lot of hypocritical Christians. Everybody's hip everyone's a hypocrite, but they are just not sold out. They're not actually Christians. They're just there for the name and name alone. So other things, um, when it comes to abortion, 80% of engaged Christians say abortion is morally wrong. Only 37% of church Christians think abortion is wrong. Um, and when you look at the other ones, it's like 40 or 50% of the rest of Gen Z agrees or disagrees. Um, only 44% of, uh, Gen of church Christians um, think that marriage should be for a lifetime. Here's the one that's a, another shocker, these two. Uh, when it comes to sexual morality, 
Uh, sexual morality, they say, should be defined by culture and yourself. So when it comes to sex before marriage, is that wrong? 76% of engaged Christians say, yes, that is wrong. Only 25% of church Christians say sex before marriage is wrong. Um, but even though they say it's not wrong, we don't see a rise in teen pregnancies. And do you know why that is? Just a little side note. Um, it's because of pornography. And this generation is indulging in pornography. And the main reason why is because with porn, you don't, they're not living by the law of consent. Um, this generation is very concerned with the law of consent because they're afraid that if they have sexual relations with someone, someone will come back and say, hey, I never gave you consent with that. But with pornography in a room by yourself, there's no consent that needs to be given. So that's probably an outlet of that. Um, homosexual behavior is morally wrong. Only 24% say that is true of church Christians. So you're just seeing a moral decline compared to historically Christian views. And so it's post-Christian. Um, and when it comes to transgender issues, uh, 61% say it's definitely okay to match, the bo- match your body and change your body to what gender you feel like. So that's just another fun fact. So I'm going to end with this. Morality is defined by culture and individuals. Truth is relative. They believe in relativism. So you believe that you can decide your own truth and society can decide their own truth. Okay, that's number two. And I've got 30 minutes to give you the other four. Do you think I can do it? Probably not, but I'm going to try. All right, we're going to move through these really quickly. The third trend that is formulating your worldview Um, is safe spaces are normal. How many of you know what a safe space is? You know what a safe space is? Yes, Dr. Haynes knows. Um, Do you ever watch videos and you see trigger warning on it? Or violent content, whatever. So safe spaces are normal. You don't like to make people feel bad. You don't like to judge and and you run from hard conversations. You are surrounded by safe space and trigger warnings. This leads to you being shy to make declarative statements, and they struggle to give answers to questions. So this is a big one. You do not like to offend people. Do any of you like to offend anyone? No. So because of the generation and the cultural norms, you don't want to offend anyone, and so you hate making declarative statements. So getting some of you to actually answer questions is hard. A lot of times you will answer, I don't know. Or you'll just go with the flow. If you've ever wondered why, man, all my friends said they, they, they agreed with me, and then all of a sudden you turn around and no one's there, it's because they're just telling you what you want to hear. They don't think lying is bad. They think offending people and judging people is bad. So they're like, hey, I can lie to you. Hey, does this look good? Man, it looks great. Psh, looks terrible. Hey, do you want to come with me to my birthday party? Anyone else wants to come? Yeah, man, I'll be there. I love it. I'm not going to show up. But you don't want to have hard conversations. And some of you are like, yeah, okay, we've done that several times. It's okay. This is a non, non-judging zone. I'm just telling you what happens. Um, so you won't answer hard questions and you won't make declarative statements. Number four. See, we moved on pretty quickly from that. Uh, you believe that real safety is a myth. We kind of hit on this earlier. But you think the world is broken and it will never really be fixed because all you've seen is war, terror, gunshots, gun violence, Bullying, by the way, I forgot to say this with social media, 33% of Generation Z has been bullied online. So 33% of you have been bullied online. But you've seen all of this in, in the social media and everything like that, so you don't think the world is a safe place, and you think it never will be. So that's why you want to earn as much money as you can and create your own safe bubble. So real safety is a myth. And this is why um, every generation has like a, a movie sequel that kind of defines them. Uh, the millennial generation, they loved Harry Potter. Apparently, that was a big thing. Uh, Harry Potter was like, oh, I love Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Fantasyland, Discovering Yourself, Wizardry. Do you know what uh, two movies have kind of earmarked your generation? The Hunger Games and Divergent. How many of you have seen Hunger Games? Yeah, all of you. Hunger Games, Divergent. And do you know what the story is of those movies? The world is broken, it's terrible, and it's a group of teenagers that are going to pull themselves up from their bootstraps. They're going to survive the terrible just anguish that they've been put in. It wasn't their decision, but they're going to right the wrong that is terrible. That's kind of your generation in a nutshell. You feel like you've been dealt a bad hand. It wasn't your fault, but you're not going to cry about it like the millennials. You're going to try to get out there and change the world. 
and you're like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to make a difference. So real safety is a myth. Number, I think this is five, um, you are a diverse generation. Did you know that you're the most racially diverse generation that we have ever had ethnically? Like the most diverse generation that we've ever had in America. And you're not only diverse in ethnicity, you're diverse in all quadrants when it comes to worldview. What I mean by that is um, when it comes to relationships, sexual identity, the way your face looks, the color, the makeup of families, multicultural, multiracial families, you have multi-generational houses. So because of the economic collapse in 2008, grandparents took in their kids, which brought you along with them. So we have a generation that has grown up in, man, everybody's in one house. It's like the Brady Bunch. Everybody's in there. And you don't even know who the Brady Bunch is, okay. Uh, but everybody's living in one house. And so you are the most diverse generation. And uh, what I tell people, if you're working with students or if you've got, you know, um, if you work in youth groups or, or anything like that, if you're a professor or, or a teacher, if you're going to work with Gen Z, Get ready for it to be messy. Gen Z is one of the most diverse generations and probably has some of the more messy things to deal with, not because of it's their fault, but they have a lot of mess going on. So I would say a majority of students in my, in a, my line of work, they come from divorced homes, broken homes. Um, they have parents in jail, parents who have been drug overdose. I have now, I think, seven, if that's right, don't quote me on that, but I think I have seven students who are being raised by their grandparents and their parents are nowhere to be found. This generation is a very messy and diverse generation. And so when you, they are used to that. And one thing that the church needs to listen to is um, the study found that Gen Z and next generation, they like to go to places that they can identify with. They like to go to places that they can identify with. Well, we have a generation that in their schools, it is very diverse. You have, do you know that 30% of Gen Z knows someone who changed their gender and switched their body? 30% of someone has known someone. So when you talk about transgender issues and homosexuality, they don't hear a term, they see a face. Like they see someone's face. And when you talk about beliefs, I think, it, I forget the statistic was, a majority of people that they go to school with do not share their beliefs. Majority of the people that they go to school with do not look like them because they are the most diverse generation. And the lines and the statistics are all pretty even with different uh, racial ethnic groups. So when they come to church, they are looking for something that they know and feel comfortable with. And when they don't see a church that's diverse and embracing different cultures or different things going on, it kind of makes them take a step back because that's not normal for them. And I'm not trying to throw stones or anything. I'm just saying you have to think about diversifying, hey, how you talk, what you do. And I'm not just talking about ethnic and racial tensions or lines. That's included, but I'm also talking about how multifamilies look. You've got like several parents involved in raising a kid now. Um, I have a student that I knew and I was discipling who dad has been through five divorces. Mom's also been through four divorces and now has a lesbian partner. And I'm having to walk this person through it because we're walking through the Bible and saying, okay, what does it say about divorce? What does it say about homosexuality? Like these are hard topics to talk about, but that's Gen Z. Get ready to get messy because they're the most diverse and they're dealing with a lot of different things that you have never seen. Uh, last but not least, parents are double-minded and we already talked about that. Uh, some parents are over-involved in some ways. Uh, what I mean by this, how they're over-involved, I don't think we talked about that. They push, push, push sports. They push, push, push uh, education. They push, push, push all types of things. <laughs> Dr. Haynes is judging me by there because she's a Gen Z parent. Um, they push a lot of things that might cause stress to Generation Z. And uh, I think uh, from studies that the youth pastors, there's actually a section in here that youth pastors, I think one of the biggest struggles um, that I have as a youth pastor is a lot of parents who bring their kids to church. A lot of students don't have church parents. They just don't. They just come because friends invited them. But a lot of parents who are in church, um, 
they don't put spiritual development as a top priority in their life or in their students' life. And so I think the statistic is only 8% or, 6 or 12% want to be more spiritually mature by the age 30. 12%. And it's because the parents don't care about it. I literally had a parent, I literally had a parent who is in our church regularly, serves. We were talking about discipling this generation and doing what we call D groups. And they said, that's just too much going on. My, my person's got a band, they've got sports, they got tests, they got all this kind of stuff. Don't make them do discipleship stuff. That's too much on their plate. And I just went, <laughs> what? That makes no sense. Can I throw something? Um, you know, that frustrates me because I'm trying to develop spiritual maturity, but that's not a high thing on parents' list, and it shows when it comes to Generation Z. Um, we've only got a few minutes left, and so um, that is what's shaping their worldview. I want to give you some points of application. Um, so there's a lot of information that we didn't get to go over, which I kind of hate that, but um, I think there's some fun things that we can talk about. So for, if you're sitting there going, okay, well, how can we, um, how we, how can we change these things? Uh, what, what can we do to make a difference? Uh, so we have, they've narrowed it down some four key worldviews to talk about and teach students about to help them stay in church and help them get closer to Jesus and actually have a real relationship. So here's four things that you should discuss with Gen Z. The worldview of the historical evidence of Jesus. Not a lot of people talk about that. There are still a lot of students that believe Jesus is some mythical creature. But when you look, a lot of historians don't disagree that there was a real dude named Jesus. Historically, it's supported. That dude was real. We just don't know if he was God or not, is what the follow-up argument is. So, historical evidence of Jesus. Talk about the origins of the Bible. Talk about science and the Bible. A lot of students think that science and the Bible cannot complement each other. They are diversely apart. They do not fit. And they believe that unless science proves it, it's not real. I hear this all the time, emotions and logic, love, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't matter unless you can prove it scientifically. And that's just not true. So we need to talk about the origins of the Bible. We need to talk about science in the Bible. And then conversations with people with other beliefs. Learn to how to have conversations with people of other beliefs. That is a major, major difference. And then um, before I give you these fun facts, I love this section by Jonathan Morrow. Um, he talks about, okay, how can we make a difference with Gen Z? How can we you know, disciple them and grow them in their worldview? How can we influence their worldview? Um, and there's a couple things. Um, he says there are two main reasons that um, they don't... Many teens appear hesitant to hold to firm beliefs on moral or religious issues. And there's two reasons that you don't hold to declarative statements. One, you don't want to come across as judgmental. The second is you can't know something unless... It, you can prove it scientifically, which we talked about. So how can we break into this worldview? How can we influence the worldview? The first is, um, there's three R's. He calls it the three R's. Reasons, relationships, and rhythms. Reasons. Talk to Gen Z why we believe what we believe. Give them a safe space to express doubt. So I actually did something like this a year ago. I invited one of the professors down. Um, and they came and did a hot topic night. And I let anyone ask the toughest questions. I said, write it in, I'll screen it, and we'll talk to him on stage, and we'll do a panel. We talked about anything from homosexuality um, to bestiality. I mean, there were some crazy things, science, you know, origins of evolution. I mean, we, we went at it. We threw down the gauntlet. And then after we read through the questions, we really focused on homosexuality and that kind of stuff and abortion. The students loved it because they got to interact with doubt. Because one thing that I think we have been kind of poor at is instead of embracing the doubt and say, hey, let me walk you through it. Let me tell you why we believe what we believe. Let me walk you through why we get to the conclusion that we're at. We just say, hey, believe it. Let's move on. Let's go. And there is faith and there is belief, but there's some things that we aren't talking about that we should talk about. The historical evidence of Jesus, the origins of Bible, the science and how Bible relate to each other, you can study and know those things and talk to them about it. So give the reasons of why we believe and give them a safe place to enjoy and engage in discussion. So reasons is the first thing. The second R is relationships. The most powerful shaping tool is the influence of relationships. 
So there's four um, relationships that you need to cultivate with Generation Z. Help them cultivate a relationship with God. Help them cultivate a relationship with parents. Help them cultivate a relationship with mentors. And help them cultivate a relationship with friends. So those things you have to guide them on. And here let me tell you real quick, I didn't get to talk about this, but why friends are so important. Do you know that friends to Generation Z rank higher in self-identity and self, um, the makeup of yourself than religion or parents? It goes education, career, hobbies, and then friends. So I, I've heard it said several times, my pastor said it several times, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Your friends actually affect your identity. It is who you are. They shape who you are. Um, and we got to talk about what's healthy relationships. What are healthy friendships? What is good for you? What is not good for you? Because sometimes it's just the blind leading the blind. I have so many knucklehead high school guys that come to me and created this big mess with relationships. They were dating some girl and they did something stupid. And they come to me and they tell me what they did. I said, why did you do that? Oh, no, I got, I got with all my friends and said, hey, guys, what should I do? And we all came up with this plan. And so I did it. And I'm like, you are so dumb. Like getting with other 16-year-olds to come up with a plan that's awful. Seek mentorship. Know when to listen and when not to listen. Don't be led by the blind. And the third thing is rhythms. We, we become what we repeatedly do. Remember that. We become what we repeatedly do. So you have to help create rhythms for Generation Z. Create rhythms in their spiritual life. And then, you know, just what they do Make sure it's good rhythms and some things like you can't build a strong worldview unless you practice it. So if you want to affect their worldview, you got to talk about these things. You got to have them talk about scripture, prayer, all these kind of things. So that is the three R's of how to influence a worldview. Uh, reasons, relationships, and last but not least, rhythms. Um, and then I want to read one last thing. When asked about what you want to accomplish before 30. Now this isn't engaged Christians from Generation Z? Because when we ask you this, your answers vary dramatically a little bit. But when you ask Generation Z, what do you want to accomplish by the age of 30? Here are the top things. You want to complete your education and career. You want to be financially independent. You want to follow your dreams. You want to enjoy life. You want to have self-discovery of who you are. You want to travel. Only 20% of Generation Z wants to get married before the age of 30. It is not on their radar. Now, a lot of people I talk to in churches, that's reversed because engaged Christians, they have a different worldview, a biblical worldview, that marriage is kind of this you know, thing up here and you can't have sex on marriage and all this stuff, and it's a good thing that's been established by God. That kind of flips. But when you talk to people who aren't engaged in a biblical worldview, marriage is very low on their list. Because to them, they can get everything they need. And marriage actually just hinders you because they've seen divorce and they've seen it happen so much. They're like, ah, I don't care. 20% say, yeah, I'd like to get married before I'm 30. 20%. If you ask my generation, I don't know. I was like, hey, I want to get married by 23. It didn't happen, but I was like me. I was like, hey, I want to get married by 23. Um, so get married. Only 16% say they want to be spiritually mature. You don't really care about being spiritually mature. You're like, eh, whatever. And then only 12% want to become a parent. So there's that. Um, I, just came, I just became a parent less than a week ago, by the way. So yeah, I've been no sleep. That's why I have this massive coffee up here. Um, but yeah, so just fun facts about Gen Z. We've got 10 minutes. We can either be done, which I know you're probably saying, hallelujah, praise Jesus. Or you can ask questions.